so much pain in you. 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 So much rage. 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 rage that you can't contain it. So the first thing I want to touch on is an epic fight scene that we see in the first episode. It's the warehouse fight scene. And I'm curious, given that fight scene is made to look like a one what is the single most difficult part of that fight choreography for you? In the warehouse, the most difficult part is when I enter the room for the first time and I see the fight happening, that choreography, there's a lot of stuff involved. There's punching, you know, there's choking. I have to choke a guy as well. All of that moment. And then from that point on, it, it was continued and we did not stop. But probably the hardest part, it, that was probably the hardest part, but it was so fun. And we had to fight with the heat literally the temperature that was inside the building as well we had fans of course but when there's ro- when we were rolling we had to turn the fans off and so it was very sweaty but it was just so fun that was probably the challenging part and it all paid off because it looks absolutely incredible oh i appreciate that thanks so the next fight i want to touch on is your fight with daredevil because we do get a glimpse of that in the trailer can you tell us a little bit about working on that fight and maybe in particular things you were able to do to enhance how different um echo and daredevil's fight styles are yeah so obviously they have both different depth or different fighting styles one of I'm deaf and he is blind. So yeah. I only worked with him for a day, but we did do a lot of practice with the choreography and the stunt training beforehand. You know, we had some sessions before that, but I was able to learn that choreography with Daredevil the last minute on the same day. So it was very much like get up and go very fast paced. And It was new choreography with Daredevil, so that was probably the challenge. That's so complicated. I'm so impressed you picked up on all that so quickly. Yeah, thank thank God I I grew up uh, with an older brother that kind of helped with my tolerance and uh, athleticism with that. Glad that paid off. All right. The next thing I wanted to touch on was your collaboration with Vincent, because he's just a one of a kind force on set where you really feel the weight of his performance. So as his scene partner, do you notice him doing anything unique or different that allows him to have that kind of authority in a scene? I know that he's been acting for such a long time. And I notice on set, I'll never forget this. When the director was trying to talk to him about a certain scene, they were talking about something in Kingpin. He was given all these suggestions and these ideas about Kingpin. And I was just sitting back watching and I was like, gosh, he's such an expert. He could be the, uh, he's working with the director as an actor. And he is kind of all these things all encompassed into one. And so he, I was watching him give all this feedback and these ideas without any hesitation. And I think I would be a little bit hesitant hesitated to give any suggestions because I am such an introverted person as well but he's just so knowledgeable in this acting world so just seeing his knowledge is beautiful and just he's a great guy to work with as well I love hearing that to tease where Maya is at at her in her journey at the very beginning of the show after she returns home at that point in the story what would you say her greatest strength is but then i also want to know what you think her greatest weakness is the thing she's going to have to overcome throughout the show in order to become a stronger hero and person a good question um i would say her strength is obviously she is so resilient And she's able to build up that resilience. You know, she has her ancestors that help her with her superpowers that make her become even more resilient. And probably a weakness of hers is trying to reconnect with faith in humanity and finding out what the definition of family is. But she's able to work on that through her story. And 
she's able to work on having those roots reconnected with her family. Such a good answer, spot on. This is one of my favorite questions to end on lately because I'm a big believer that no one in this business tells themselves good job nearly enough. So can you tell me something you did while making Echo that you know you can look back on and say to yourself, damn, I am proud of what I did there. First of all, I am so damn proud of myself. I thought that I would never be able to finish the show, but you know, we I did that. And I had the support of coworkers along the entire way and the support of the directors and everybody just came together and helped me through it. And that's probably what my proudest moment is, is because I did it. Maya. I see everything that you are. I always have. So my first question for you is what happens to someone after they are shot like Fisk is? Is there anything about him after the fact that makes him more dangerous than ever? I, I think that, you know, it, it does in the long run. I think it, it means a lot in a very kind of, the way we played it out, it it's, um, is subtle and you understand why he shows up and tries to get him back, her back. Not just the fact that they have this kind of father-daughter relationship, but the fact that he, why he comes back after she's shot him and what he does to heal himself and, and what he plans on, what he thinks the outcome is going to be. It's it all is it's it's all kind of tied together in a very kind of subtle way. So to get the flip side of that now, at this point in his journey, what do you think his greatest weakness is? The potential thing that could do him in on his mission now? You know, it's an interesting question because the last episode of this series deals with that a little bit. And um there's a battle that takes place over that exact subject. So I really can't say anything about it. Oh, I'll take that. That ups my intrigue for the end of the season so, so much. Here's one other weakness question for you. Is is he unkillable? How has he survived what he has survived at this point? Because MCU canon says so. That's why. <laughs> It's an excellent answer to that question right there. I have to ask about your collaboration with Alakwa now because it is a major standout. What is something about her as a scene partner that you really appreciate that maybe helps you reach something in your own character that you wouldn't have been able to find without her? Every scene that we did together. I mean, every scene that we did together, It, I, I couldn't have, um, I mean, I rarely expect a scene to turn out in a certain way anyway, but... This in particular, she's just so good. She's so, so talented. And, you know, the fact that she's so new and she's able to be this confident and this strong on a set, we, you know, it was a there's some very intense stuff in this in this series between her and my character. And um, Alakwa just nailed it every time. She's just immensely, immensely talented. And, you know, the action stuff, too. I saw just a, the other day, I saw the long, one of the long fight scenes that she has, and it's just amazing. You don't question for a second that she can't kick these people's butt. You know, it's amazing. I know uh, you're not allowed to tell us a whole lot about uh, Daredevil Born Again, but I am curious to hear a little bit maybe about how your collaboration with Charlie has evolved, and actually maybe particularly his craft. Given you've worked together before, is there anything that you saw him do on that set that made you go like, I knew you were good in that role, but I never realized you were capable of doing that? I mean, always with Charlie. Or Charlie and I are good friends, so it's really not, you know, like, it's, I, I just adore the guy you know he's 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 a really prepared and talented actor and um you know he doesn't mess about you know like the two of us are similar in that we don't um, waste a lot of time when we're acting and um we just like to get come in get the job done and and uh he and and, and bring and bring a whole life to it and and, and charlie does that um uh, i remember when we first started the netflix series 
um, I had to do the first scene that we actually did together. I was off camera uh, on a walkie talkie and you never see, it was a different day. You see my, we shot my side on a different day and his side on a different day. So I was like off screen watching him and feeding him lines over the walkie talkie. And I had never seen him do a scene before. And so just the way he moved around the office and jumped up on the furniture and stuff, I was like, oh my God, this is, this is the show is going to work. Like this is, that guy just, you know, jumped up on that desk without any effort whatsoever and is delivering these lines the way he was. And I thought this is going to work. Like really in one, in one scene, just watching him, I knew that the whole series was going to work. It was pretty amazing. So first, I want to tease both of your characters. Can you each tell me something they stand to gain from, from Maya returning home? But then I also want to know a potential problem that that poses for them. Ooh, that's a great question. That's a good question. Uh, for Uncle Henry, forgiveness. Mm. And ooh, a potential problem. Maya. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what Maya's, you know, Uncle Henry doesn't know what Maya's going to do. It's, it's, yeah, I'd say that would be that's it. That's a fair answer, <laughs> yeah. I think for Bonnie, for the character I play, uh, what she stands to gain from Maya coming home as a sister. They grew up together, even though technically they're cousins, like they're more like sisters. And, and I think the problem that her returning poses is she kind of has to learn who her cousins become, which is this anti-hero, which is this person who's really violent and involved in organized crime. So I think it's um, it raises some pretty complicated emotions for Bonnie. There's such a good description right there. Oh, thanks. I want to come back your way to ask you about reuniting with Sydney. I only yeah. spoke to her for seven minutes, but she seems incredible. Yes. Given the fact that you've worked with her before, what is something she did on the set of Echo that made you go? Like, I knew you were really good, but I never realized you were capable of doing that. Oh my God, Sydney was just such a rock star through all of it. She's been like eat, sleep, and breathing Echo. <laughs> Even before all of it, her dog is named Echo. Um, I met Echo. <laughs> which is so, like, so sweet. Um, so yeah, I think I always knew Sydney was, was a badass and would really command it. I think there's some scenes that are coming for like the grand finale that are the ones that really solidify that she was the person to uh, shepherd this story. Uh, but one of my favorite things on set of working with Sydney was she's she's somebody who's like pretty soft spoken and she's really calm and level headed and almost like a little bit shy like a lot of new people are. And um, but there there was something about her signing when she was speaking ASL to to Alakwa that like all of a sudden this super outgoing person would come <laughs> and she would be like God, nice and she was like so animated and big that I was like I love this. <laughs> do you two see her doing a monitor dance? at all? Does she do anything behind the monitor that signals to you she's really digging a take? I didn't. I... Oh, she's like in it. She's got her headphones on and she's wrapped in. And then after, this is a sign for nice. And she'd be like, nice, <laughs> nice. And she would be like so into it. Oh, I'll take that. <laughs> all right, I'll use this as my excuse to ask my reservation dogs question because obviously the show has come to a close. And I know sometimes when you're a little far removed and you have time to reflect, you can find new things about it that you appreciate even more than when you were doing it. So has that happened to you just based on yourself or maybe based on viewer reaction as well? I think getting to share the last and, and final season with audiences is obviously bittersweet. Um, it was really beautiful, and, and I still don't know that I've fully reckoned with the fact that it's over because we haven't really had a chance to talk about it yet. Uh, but there were so many people who worked on Echo who were from Reservation Dogs. We had a lot of crossover, uh, and I think I was really... I think I'm just really grateful and fortunate enough to be a part of both of these really awesome projects. I think that's a fair statement right there. <laughs> you also wrote and directed on that, so it was making me wonder. And I know you're a comic reader, too. If you could write and or direct for any Marvel character, which would you choose and why? Oh, my gosh. That's such a, that's such a good question. I would probably... If they continue with uh, any Echo comics and moving forward, I would love to be able to write for Maya Lopez. <laughs> I like the sound of that. I'll plus one that. That could happen. <laughs> Chesky, I'll, I'll toss that back to you. Of all of the Marvel shows and films that have come out thus mm -hmm. far, I want to know which is your favorite, but I also want to know which one. You can't pick your own. That's true. Okay, okay, <laughs> I, saw okay. That looking, okay. Right? <laughs> I also want to know which one surprised you the most and maybe made you realize like all the storytelling possibilities that the franchise has to offer. Okay, so the first 
person's what's my favorite? favorite. That's the my easy favorite. one. That's okay, why yeah, I had to yeah. add a second one. I, you know, I, I would say uh, Iron Man. Mm -hmm. the first, classic. You know, I yeah, like the it. classic one. I, I really like that one. And what was the second question? One that you saw that kind of surprised you and like blew the door open to all of the creative possibilities that the Marvel Cinematic Universe has to offer. Thor Ragnarok. Mm. Yeah, I thought that was something brilliant. I thought, I don't know what it was. The it's the way it was shot, the music, the pace. I don't know what it was, but Ragnarok. I really, I really think that that's a phenomenal a plus so choice yeah, right yeah. there. So I was reading that everyone on this set learned American Sign Language mm -hmm. to make the show. Can you tell me like a favorite sign, like a phrase that stuck with you? But then oh, yeah, also. I do. I, 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 we put a <laughs> question, though, of course. I also want to know a tip you might give to somebody else out there who maybe watches this and then feels inspired to learn themselves. Mm. Yeah. I think the, the tip would be patience with yourself mm. um, and knowing that this is how people communicate and you should be very grateful that you're learning this for these people and being able to... Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, just being grateful that you're, you're able to participate in that world. What's your favorite sign? Do you have a favorite I sign? I do, I do. <laughs> Maya taught it to me, or uh, Lachlan taught it to me. Is the Should, camera on? Are we going to have to blur it out? Yeah, I'll be just show it to you right <laughs> here. Right, right we'll here. blur it out. Okay, right here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I dig it, I dig it. I love it. Uh, that's cute. Mine's a little more like... G rated. Mine, <laughs> mine's PG. Okay, <laughs> what my, is it? My favorite sign is comfortable. Because oh. I'm a I'm super cozy in my life. Like I always beautiful. like to be comfy, so comfortable. Oh, it feels I like a perfect that. sign for it. Okay. Okay, I like um, that. And then the any tips. That was your question. Yes. Right? Any tips for people who are wanting to learn ASL? I would say to learn from deaf teachers. I think that's really important to learn about deaf culture and to learn about the, the language from the people who, who were raised with it and who are willing to teach it. I had a chance to learn ASL from the Sign Language Center who has been really incredible and, and they really uh, promote having deaf instructors. Hmm. Great answers right there. I'll squeeze in one more before I have to leave you because you have such an exceptional ensemble in the show. Can you each name a time on set when a scene partner gave you just what you needed and maybe that helped you access something in your own character that you wouldn't have been able to reach without them? Hmm. Yeah. I don't want to go into it though, but it, it dealt with a Lakwa. Oh, spoilers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if it's a spoiler, but it was a very emotional scene and, and she helped me out a lot on that. So I, hmm. I appreciate that. I want to know. I would also have to say, working with Alakwa, there was um, there's such a, a complicated history between Maya and Bonnie, and and so much hurt, but so also so much love. And so we did a lot of work in making sure that we were able to feel the history between them, and to to feel the the heartache and missing each other. And so yeah, I think it was just like. It's one thing to be able to read a script and to practice like ASL, but it's another to act off of a human being and, and to connect with Alakwa and the emotions that she gave. And then also the moments where she shut me out intentionally as Maya were really, really effective in, in activating Bonnie to like get frustrated and be like, no, listen, like, um, yeah, to, because Bonnie's whole goal is to reconnect her family. Tigers move in silence to catch their prey. You are a tiger, Maya. What did you do? First question for you is about signing on for this show. When you first joined the Echo team, what is something you were really eager to bring to Maya's story and the character too? But then also, can you tell me something you found along the way that wound up re being really important for you to emphasize? Yeah, you know, I think when I first when I first pitched on the project and when I had the the opportunity to speak with Kevin, you know, one of the things that I remember mentioning was like I grew up reading comic books, specifically Marvel comic books, and I grew up going to powwows. And those two things like never overlap. There was no intersect. I read comic books at powwows and I probably um I know actually I never saw a powwow in a comic book. But um, but those two things never overlap. They never intersected with each other. And the both exciting and terrifying thing about this is that those two things came smashing together. So it was like, for myself personally, it was just an opportunity to, to do something that I hadn't even imagined mm -hmm. myself. 
If and something isn't terrifying, it's not exciting at it's all. It's not exciting. <laughs> Especially in this industry. Yeah, yeah. So you get an opportunity to direct the pilot episode and kind of set the tone and style for future episodes. So are there any specific things you deliberately strove to do in episode one that we'll see in every episode of Echo? Yeah, you know, I think I think with authenticity being important, like it wasn't a maybe, it was a must for, for, for myself and everyone involved. Um, and so... I'm indigenous, but I'm not deaf. So one of the first things that I did and my department heads did and my, and my crew did is that we all started taking ASL classes early on. And um, uh, that actually ended up dictating our entire visual style. So what do I mean by that? Um, uh, you know, in our, in, so for example, between you and I speaking right now, the words coming out of my mouth, that's the text. But the way I'm delivering those words, that's the subtext, right? So those two things give the full emotional intent of what I'm trying to communicate to you. In ASL, it's slightly different. So when you sign, it's typically here or here. And the signing, that's the text, right? But the, the facial expressions and the way that you emote and express that through body language, that's the subtext. So you need both the signing and the facial expression to get the full emotional con context, right? Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? That means in our show, this is a close-up. So it, to get, and because this is a close-up for Maya Lopez and Alaco, that means it's a close-up for everybody else. So in this case, that was a very positive consequence that came from us taking ASL classes and it ended up dictating the entire visual style for the show. I am very curious to hear about the action style as well because one thing you do exceptionally well, like even in the first episode al alone, is put us in her shoes as she's experiencing these fights. So can you talk about some techniques you use to give us that feeling? Yeah, you know, I think, um, uh, again, without spoiling anything, in the first episode, there's a uh, action set piece that is one shot. Warehouse is exceptional. I am obsessed with oneers. That is high up on my list now. Oh, hell Job yeah. well done. Hell yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a lot of people work very, very hard on that. Um, you know, and I think, but again, it, because everything stems from story and, and looking at the page, the thing that I loved about that was that Maya Lopez entered that scene as a teenage girl but she left as a cold-blooded killer. And so it was always important for me that the audience and her, that we were able to see that transfer transformation take place in real time. And, um, and so that lent itself to the one or nature of how we shot it. And I remember in talking with Mark Skizak, our stunt coordinator, and we were talking like, oh man, this is ambitious. We're on a TV schedule. And you know, you watch those, you know, some of our influences like Atomic Blonde or uh, you know, there's a great fight sequence in there. Um, you know, some John Wicks, uh, I think Lady Vengeance was another one. They have weeks and weeks and weeks. I think, I think Tom Glad had like 10 weeks of, of rehearsal. We had probably two weeks. And so we knew it was ambitious going in, but we wanted to take a big swing. It's exceptional. It pays off that you jumped into that so, so well. Because we get a glimpse of him in the trailer, I'll also ask about directing a daredevil fight too. What are some specifics to his fighting style that opened up some like new creative doors for you to explore when crafting that? Oh, you know, it was interesting because the, in the, one of the first meetings with Charlie, and he's a very thoughtful uh, actor, and he takes a lot of, he puts a lot of thought into the character, and you can see why that 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 other series was such a success. Uh, in addition to you know, beyond the writing as well too. But in the very first meeting, he he said uh, he said if Daredevil is blind and Maya Lopez is deaf, how do they communicate? And we were already months into prep at this pro uh, at this point, and. And I was sort of dumbfounded, and you know, my, my producers were there as well too. And we were just like, we hadn't even thought of that. Oh my goodness, we have to go back to the drawing board. And so we went back, and it sparked all these conversations. But um, you know, I think uh, I'm trying to think what a, a specific uh, Daredevil moment came about. I'm trying to. I'm trying to think of something without spoiling it, but. Understandable, understandable. We don't want to spoil anything too yeah. soon, but what I saw, A plus yet again, oh, exceptional fight scene. Um, I did want to bring up Reservation Dogs because there are a bunch of people from that show that are now working on this. Can you talk a little bit about the value of building a filmmaking family and why that can enhance a finished product when you're working with people that you've worked with before? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because you know, Reservation Dogs was sort of like, we all know each other, and so we're all friends. And so when the opportunity came to make this, like we've all known each other in some cases for decades. Um, and so when, and, but in addition to that, the Native American community is, um, is small. You know, it is small, it's a tight-knit group. We all talk to each other, we all know each other. And um, so in this case, with something like this, like, 
you know, bringing in Devery and, and Cody Lightning and, you know, Alaco Cox I hadn't worked with before. Chosky Spencer was someone I admired for a long time. Uh, Graham Green and Tantu Cardinal were, I grew up watching them, you know, so to have the opportunity to bring them in, it was both, it was a chance to bring in both your heroes and your friends and, and, and just <laughs> smash them in together. Oh, and it's so effective here. I have one uh, reservations dog, reservation dogs ending question for you too, because like now we're, we're a little far removed from it. And sometimes when you could think back to something, it could, you know, take on, take on new light or you can come to appreciate things in it more than you have before. So given that the story is now completely Complete. Is there anything that is more powerful than you ever anticipated it could be when you first started working on the show? On Reservation Dogs? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I think uh, it's interesting because when the first when the first um, season came out, about halfway through the season, Sterling was, was I think we were on set. No, I think we were on set. And he came to us and he said, you know, Hulu, the Hulu executives, they came to us and they said, we're getting all these spikes in viewership in these random parts of the country, uh, Montana, Wyoming, South Dakota, North Dakota, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, Oklahoma, uh, Minnesota, Washington. They're so random. And Sterling was like, those are all places where there are reservations. And, you know, I think that illustrated uh, this sort of disconnect of there isn't a, an audience or there isn't viewership for Native American content. And that, and that simple conversation proved that there absolutely is. My first questions are about Marvel Spotlight. First, hey. what does it mean to have Echo being the show to kick off the Marvel Spotlight banner? It is really awesome for us. Uh, it's awesome for me personally that I got to work on Echo, which is the first under the Marvel Spotlight banner. Uh, like a lot of things we do here at the studio, it was rooted in the comics. In the 70s, there was a series of Marvel Spotlight comics where some hugely iconic characters that are still around today, like Ghost Rider and Spider-Woman, they first got their main first real story in a Marvel Spotlight comic. So we have all of these characters from the larger comics canon that we want to tell stories about. And now that we have you know, Marvel television that we can, we can show these characters and tell these stories, it was just a way for us to say like, hey, Here's a character that's a little more obscure from the comics, but we hope you enjoy this show about them. I know it's been teased that there'll be contained stories that will hopefully allow you to take big creative swings, but yeah. is there anything about how Echo could set the tone for the banner that you're really looking forward to exploring? Yeah, and it all just happened kind of naturally. You know, we are the first TVMA show for Marvel Studios. Mm, I have questions about that. <laughs> um, we're the first show being released on Hulu and Disney Plus at the same time. Um, so yeah, I just think that there's diff for different shows, there's different release models and different stories being told on different platforms. It's just a fun and exciting thing that we have all these opportunities to do different things right now. So one more question yeah. about Spotlight, because I am curious about the rules of Spotlight. No rules. Is Maya, well, okay, well that might answer this question. Is Maya able to come out of this zone and still make it into other Marvel projects. Absolutely, absolutely. Ooh. I think that's always the hope with any of our characters is that we get to see them pop again in in more of their own shows or movies and then in other shows and movies with other characters. That's that always the, the right answer. The hope and the promise. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, the I just want more of her. <laughs> it's the truth. I know, me too. All right, so now I'm going to go to the, the right. TVMA thing because it's the first uh, Marvel show to be rated that way. Yeah. What do you think it was about this story that, that warranted that? Uh, Maya Lopez is a badass, and when we meet her, she is a villain that's kind of murdering some people. So uh, I don't think we could have done it any other way. <laughs> if we wanted to make it more kid-friendly, we could have, but it might have taken the edge away from what you know Maya is and what her story could have been. Uh, so it just came with the, the character. Okay, so getting to play in that space now, I am curious, is there any particular scene of the show mm -hmm. where you were kind of doing some, some trial and error in terms of figuring out how far you could push it with that rating? Uh, no, all the fight scenes, whether they were directed by Sydney Freeland, of course, or our, our director, Kat McKenzie, who did the skate rink fight. Mm, uh, good fight. Yeah, they both were like, can we go this far? And every step of the way, we were like, yes, go as far as you want. Um, and we'll, we'll figure it out later if we went too far or not, but we never did. We were even in editorial being like, oh, man, how can we push this even further? It was, yeah. I like that It was mentality. fun being able to do this. All right. Now, you brought this up before, mm -hmm. but it is the first Marvel show to drop in the binge watch mm. form. What do you think it is about this story that will make it best experienced, binged, rather than watched week to week? Sure. I think this story is just one that you want to keep watching. I think it's exciting. Our episodes are really awesome and action-packed in a way that... 
I think you just want to keep watching and tune in. And again, on Disney Plus and Hulu and with all of our television series going forward, I think you'll see different release models for the story and how they're being told. You'll see What If right now, for example, is being released Mm -hmm. uh, nine episodes over nine nights around the holidays. You know, I think each show will have its own unique thing that really... uh, treats the viewers to the best version of that story. Keep it fresh. I'm open to that. So looking at your run with Marvel, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe Echo marks your very first executive producer credit on a show, but you've worked on some of the most iconic films and shows of the franchise. So is there any past MCU project that you worked on that you found coming in handy the most when making your EP debut on (laughs) Echo? Well, I came right off of Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness onto Echo and... That movie was, you know, big and crazy monster, and this in its own way was also a big and crazy monster, but different. Uh, they were both fun to make, but going from that to this, no, not really. It's all it's all the same, and we just got to have fun. What was fun about this one, uh, compared to Doctor Strange, is it was all happening in camera, and there was hand-to-hand fighting, and it was Alakwa on set being a badass and being brutal, and there wasn't a lot of CG backgrounds and stuff, and I love that, and I love Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness so much, so thank you for asking about it. But what was fun about Echo was getting to see her kick ass in a skate rink in Oklahoma, and it wasn't multiversal stakes. Mm. It was the stakes of one woman and her family. Oof. I love that. I have a couple follow-up questions. First one that crossed my mind, because you brought up Alakwa, you obviously are, you know, you very much know how talented she is, but when you hit the Echo set, is there anything she did that made you stop and go? Like, I knew you were good, but I didn't realize you were capable of that. (laughs) Yeah, two things. One is uh, she kicks ass, and she is a powerhouse and relentless when it comes to the action and just wants to do everything on her own and can do it all on her own. Uh, And the other thing is just that she's kind of like Clint Eastwood in that she does so much with her face and she's so intimidating and has such a presence. Uh, and then when, when Sid yells cut, um, she's a Lockwell again and she's, ha- and it's just funny to see her turn on that badassery. I feel, I feel like that's a pretty good comp right there. I, yeah. I approve of that. So going back to what you were saying before, you answered this kind of with the skate ring question, but mm-hmm. I am, uh, I am curious, what do you think people will see in this show? Assume it was done with VFX <laughs> in post, but oh. it was actually shot in camera. Interesting. I guess all the fight scenes. Yeah, we, we, Alakwa did a lot of it herself. We had great uh, stunt choreographers, and of course, she had stunt double for some of the bigger stuff and, you know, jumping around the train and everything. But all of it was done mostly in camera. Our VFX team that we love very much really came in to kind of do background extensions and stuff like that. But most of the stuff was set builds and on set. It, yeah. <laughs> 